Glad to be back in Montana. I got back last year, uh, about a year ago, in early April, and what a time to come back uh, to help celebrate the uh, 50th anniversary of the uh, of the Wilderness Act. And when I got back to the region, one of the first things uh, uh, met up with Joni Packard, another Alaskan, and and she gave me a, a copy of a CD of the movie or the film on Trammel. And tonight we're here to. Um, uh, to honor the, the, uh, the Wilderness Institute and Natalie specifically and some folks here uh, as uh, a partner. It was the Regional Foresters annually. Uh, we give out, the Regional Forester gives out about 10 awards in the, reading, uh, in the region. And this is an extremely prestigious one that we did uh, share with folks last uh, uh, October. And I, I think, Natalie, you were traveling at the time. And so we looked for a great opportunity. I was looking forward to this lecture, and so I got the opportunity to come here and present this on behalf of the region and, and Faye Kruger at the time. But um, um, and it, it is uh, it has been an amazing partnership, um, Natalie. I think your expertise on the Wilderness Management Act uh, and, and bringing that out in, in, the, in the film and travel just helped everybody. The students, uh, I think they were in your classes of Wilderness and Civilization. Um, there might, are there any in here that were in the movie? I haven't recognized I any. So. I was looking tonight when I came in, but uh, certainly the students uh, offered uh, a whole lot uh, to this. And, and again, this is just one of uh, an example of many partnerships where we're working together with uh, the Institute and, and uh, uh, the University here. And so on behalf of the Forest Service, it's my pleasure to uh, present you with this award and a certificate. So, thank you. Thank you. to more projects with folks. It was a lot of fun to put that together. And uh, you guys should check out the movie Untrammeled and then try to pick out the folks on campus that were in the movie. And Kelsey, who's over there in the teal sweatshirt, can help you find those people on campus because it was during her year of wilderness and so. Great. Um, all right, so continuing on with the evening's festivities, I would now like to introduce tonight's speaker. Dr. Robert Green joined the faculty in the School of Forestry in 1969 and served 
for 28 years, including one year as interim dean in the College of Forestry. While there, he started the Wilderness Institute and studied the naturally recovering wolf population in the North Fork of the Flathead area. He also served in the Montana House of Representatives for 15 years and most recently chaired the Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Commission from 2009 to 2013. And now going off the biological description that he gave me, I would just like to say personally that uh, since I started my tenure at the Wilderness Institute, Bob has been an incredible resource and a wonderful mentor. So it's with my pleasure that I hand over the lecture series to him for the evening. So let's welcome him. Thank you, Natalie. And uh, I attended Natalie's lecture two weeks ago and got some ideas from that uh, for talking tonight. But before I start, I want to introduce uh, three or four people uh, because I'll talk about them a little bit. First of all, Dale Harris uh, was the first uh, assistant director, or, or I call him executive director of the Wilderness Institute way back in 1975, 74 and 75. Uh, and Ken Wall was the uh, assistant director, he was in charge of the field studies programs. His wife Robin was in the second wilderness and civilization class, 1976, and also did a lot of the field studies. And then uh, we have one of the original faculty members, Tom Birch, from philosophy department. He's still teaching this semester uh, a seminar on wilderness philosophy. So. Um, those were some of the uh, people that helped get the Wilderness Institute started. Well, um, Natalie talked about sense of place, and I, I have to admit I'm from Wisconsin, so I couldn't resist putting this in, what people think of Wisconsin. Uh, and I grew up on a small farm just outside of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but at a very early age I started riding the range uh, when I was two years old, <laughs> this is our milk cow on the farm I grew up on. But more importantly in this picture, we had about 10 acres of woods adjacent to our place where I spent most of my time probably in childhood from the day school let out in the spring until started in fall, I was barefoot. <laughs> and. Uh, you know, I still fondly re remember the deciduous forests of the Midwest when I go back there to visit. It's, it's really neat seeing that green and I can still picture the smells of the, the deciduous forest in the fall. It was a great place, but I wanted to come west. Uh, I took a roundabout way to get here. I went to a three-room school in Wisconsin. The first and second grade were in the same school that my mother and grandmother went to. Third, fourth, and fifth grade were in another room, sixth, seventh, and eighth in a, a third room. And uh, that was until seventh grade. And my dad worked for Soil Conservation Service. He transferred to Washington, D.C. And all of a sudden, I was in a 2000 <laughs> uh, student uh, junior high in Bethesda, Maryland which was quite a shock. And then he came home one day and said, how would you like to go to Thailand? We all said, sure, where is it? <laughs> uh, we went to Thailand for two years, and uh, the first year was what I call my gap year. <laughs> I took it a little earlier than kids do nowadays. Uh, I didn't go to school because there was no school there at the time. And then I went to a boarding school in northern India, up in the mountains, 7,000 feet in the foothills of the Himalayas. It was a great school, and we did quite a bit of hiking back into the hills from there. Came back to Milwaukee for a year, and then uh, my dad was transferred to the Philippines, and so I finished high school there. And last month, I went to my 60th high school reunion in the Philippines. It had a great time. Anyhow, that's a little bit of background. My first, uh, I did a lot of outdoor activities, probably more outdoor activities than studying while I was at Wisconsin, but they had a real neat outdoor club. So I did rock climbing, canoeing, uh, sailing, uh, backpacking, all sorts of things. And that's where I really kind of developed an interest in wilderness and wild places. Uh, my first job out of Graduate school was at the University of Denver, and I did a lot of backpacking and skiing there, and also was part of the 
Colorado Open Space Coordinating Council Wilderness Workshop. And uh, the person that headed that up was Estella Leopold, the daughter of Aldo Leopold. And uh, that was kind of a neat uh, workshop. They did a lot of act, uh, active work on wilderness designation in Colorado. Of course, that's the time the Wilderness Act passed as well. I was in Denver. Then I had an opportunity to go back and work on a new wilderness research project for the Forest Service. I was at the North Central Forest Experiment Station. Bob Lucas, who later came to Montana, was my boss there. So I spent three years in the Boundary Waters Canoe Area from beginning of May until late October uh, uh, out in the field and we were looking at fire history, uh, describing plant communities and the last year I was there, well, we studied mosquitoes and black flies too. <laughs> the last year I was there I got involved with Dave Meach on the wolf research project and was there when he captured and radio collared his first wolf. That study is still going on now, what, 47 years later. Uh, but I spent part of that winter ra radio tracking five different uh, wolf packs that had radio collars on them. Um, and then I came to the University of Montana in 69. And I came at a time when the Bully Committee was actively involved in and working on the Bully Committee report on forest management on the Bitterroot National Forest, which uh, became very famous or infamous, depending on how you looked at it. But uh, it was an interesting time. We also had a lot going on in Montana with the Wilderness Association and the activists in that group. Uh, the Scapegoat Wilderness uh, became the first citizen-initiated wilderness area in the country, and, uh, passed a uh, bill in 1973. Uh, I started doing an elk logging study down on the Sapphire Range, uh, uh, just south of town here. Uh, we radio collared a lot of uh, elk and followed their movements in relation to logging activity, uh, roads, and so on. And in 73, I started the Wolf Ecology Project. I'll come back to that, but for the first six years, it really wasn't much in the way of field research because we were just searching for evidence of any wolves in Montana. And then in 74, we started the Wilderness Institute. And in 75, the first Wilderness and Civilization program. So I'll come back to uh, some of those things as we go along. It was also a great place to bring up my kids. Some of you may know my daughter Tarn Reem lives here in Missoula. That was her first fish. <laughs> she teaches uh, African dance here at the university. and. Uh, with private groups. My son Rolf in the middle there is a scientist with the National Marine Mammal Lab in Seattle and works up in the Pribilof Islands and the Aleutian chain. And then my son Jake on the right there is uh, at Colorado College uh, finishing up this uh, May. They were all, they are all great skiers. <laughs> and uh, you know I used to keep ahead of them until they became six or eight years old and then they were <laughs> way past me. <laughs> but uh, I've stuck with it. I think I've skied 35 days this winter so far. Well, and it's over, unfortunately, <laughs> basically. And uh, like I say, I couldn't keep up with them. So last Saturday, I tried something different, a little water skiing. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that, was, that was at the Great Divide Ski Area last Saturday. I survived. Uh, Natalie wanted me to talk a little bit about the Wolf Project. It, it really was a unique project because uh, I'd been trying to find wolves for six years and finally got some support in fall of 78 to hire two biologists and uh, in 79 Bruce McClellan, the grizzly bear researcher on the right from British Columbia, called me and said he'd been seeing a wolf up the North Fork pretty regularly and tracks of a wolf. So Joe Smith, who had experienced trapping wolves in Minnesota, was one of the biologists I hired, went up there. And sure enough, on April 8th of 79, he captured a wolf. Turned out she was a lone female for two years. And then a, a black male joined her. and in the fall of 81, and they had five pups that spring of 82. And that was the beginning of what we were 
to follow for the, the next uh, 10, 10 or 15 years uh, up in the North Fork of the Flat, a beautiful place to work. Uh, that is the U.S.-Canada border. It's not an imaginary line. <laughs> there really is an area a swath cut out all along the border there. The first wolf den was north of the border, about five miles in the valley flats up there. And, uh, the, but the pack would regularly cross back and forth over the border. I don't know if they could still do that with Homeland Security, but um, in, by 86, the pack was up to 12 wolves. And uh, this was way down in Sullivan Meadow, down in uh, Glacier Park. And that spring, two females in the pack bred, the original female and another one, and the original female continued to use the den north of the border, but the other female uh, denned uh, south of the border in Glacier National Park. And the population continued to increase from there. Uh, as you see, uh, 96 uh, kind of leveled off there, and I think has leveled off a number of places. Uh, this map is not just our study. Ours would be up way up near the Canadian border there. But it just shows uh, that about 10% uh, of the wolves in any pack over a period of time do disperse, particularly when they come up to breeding age, which is almost two years old. They take off and sometimes travel very long distances in a very short period of time. There are two long ones that aren't even on this map. We had one that went 550 miles north into Alberta from the North Fork of the Flathead there on the border, way up into the Peace River country in Alberta. And you probably read recently where a wolf from Wyoming that was radio collared ended up on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. So they're capable of these very long movements. I think that one of these days we'll end up with wolf packs, perhaps in the Wasatch Mountains in Utah or down in Colorado. All, all it takes is two to tango, and <laughs> they take off from there. Uh, this is roughly the distribution of, this was 2012, but it's pretty much the same today, uh, distribution of packs in Montana. Uh, some of these wolves are part of the Idaho, central Idaho recovery area, basically this, these packs, and some are from the Yellowstone recovery area. Those are a result of reintroductions into central Idaho in 1995 and 96, and the same with Yellowstone reintroduction. But what a lot of people don't realize in Montana is that two-thirds of our wolves are from that original natural recovery, not reintroduction. You hear everybody complaining about these giant, ravenous, uh, diseased wolves brought down from Canada that were reintroduced into Montana. Well, it's nonsense. And uh, uh, again, two-thirds of them in Montana are a result of natural recovery, not reintroduction. For Montana as a whole, uh, this is more recent years. Uh, and it appears that the population here has leveled off. Uh, it's too early to say that for sure. We don't have the final data yet from 2014, but from talking to the wolf biologists working for the state of Montana, they all tell me that they've seen a decline this year, but I don't know how much of a decline. Uh, and then the harvests are shown below. I would emphasize these are minimum counts. The actual number of wolves in Montana is probably on the order of 800 uh, wolves. And so they're here to stay. You know, one of the things when I left Minnesota and came to Montana and went backpacking, <laughs> there was always one element missing. I couldn't hear any wolves howling like I did in Minnesota pretty regularly. And uh, now they are back in, in most of our wilderness areas in Montana. Okay, switching gears a little bit, back to the very start of the Wilderness Institute. Um, I put together a meeting in spring of 1974, and uh, Bob Lucas, who had been my boss in Minnesota, uh, he and George Stanky were in the research lab here on campus. Uh, the uh, 
they headed up the Wilderness Research Project. But we invited a lot of people, people from diverse backgrounds, uh, conservationists, uh, Forest Service people, I think I left off, there was one BLM person there, Cliff Martinka, came down from Glacier. Uh, so a pretty diverse group of people. We met up at Lubrecht Forest, and uh, generally people agreed, yeah, we ought, to, we ought to form a Wilderness Institute. It's a great place to do it with the resources that we have, uh, with the research project, with Region 1 of the Forest Service being here. <coughs> um, and a supportive dean, uh, Dean Wambach was the dean at that time, closely following uh, behind Arnold Boley. Uh, I might mention also, and Thurman Trosper was on the board of the Wilderness Society, the national organization, but he also is a me member of the uh, Confederated, Confederated Salish Kootenai tribes, and uh, he was a valuable addition. I might mention that the five people listed here on the left were recently uh, inducted into the Outdoor Legacy Hall of Fame uh, last fall, which is a new thing that just started up, recognizing individuals who have uh, made major contributions to Montana conservation efforts. So that was uh, the organizational meeting. Following that, then, the, there was an executive committee uh, appointed that drew up uh, uh, plans for, well, a statement of purpose and organizational structure. So they worked through the fall and on into 75. So se 75 is really officially, I guess, when the Institute started. And in fact, in 1976, the Board of Regents uh, officially approved it as a program within uh, the university system. Um, I don't need to read through all of these. It, uh, dissemination of information was important. Uh, working with public agencies, uh, important. Uh, developing professional expertise uh, and, and education. Those were the, the main thrusts. Uh, and they all kind of fed into each other. Basic to all of this was a great group of undergraduate and graduate students that have worked with us from, from day one to make this thing work. Uh, both Dale and Ken uh, helped get this off to a great start with very, might, very low salaries, I might mention. <laughs> we didn't have much to go on at the time. We did a lot of begging and borrowing. But the main programs, the uh, field studies, uh, education, research, and all of those things fed into the information center, but the, I have the arrows going back and forth here. This was taken right out of our five-year report that Dale put together, and there's Dale, as he was 40 years ago and as he is tonight. <laughs> His hair is a little whiter. <laughs> uh, I also would add that Gail, Dale has been the key person behind the Great Burn Study Group for 45 years now, basically. Um, kept it going all, through all those years. And again, Ken uh, did all the field studies and information center work. And Ken and Robin currently own Geodata Services, is that still the title, in here in um, Missoula. Uh, doing GIS work for a lot of different agencies and organizations. Uh, okay, we we'll move into the Wilderness and Civilization program. Out of that organizational meeting, we found other people like Tom Birch and Dexter Roberts and others on campus who expressed an interest in, I think it evolved from a discussions that Tom and Dexter and I and some others had and followed on the heels of a program called Round River. Uh, which was an experimental program that went on for a couple of years uh, at the university. Uh, but that first year we had 28 students taking five classes. Uh, we started with an 11-day backpack trip and split them into four groups. Uh, Journals were kept. Uh, it was sort of aimed at sophomore level, but we had people at all different levels over the years, including some continuing education students who already had degrees in some other area and just wanted to come back and do this experience. 
This was the first class, 1975. They don't look much different than you guys now, right? <laughs> uh, we did the Selway Bitterroot Wilderness. I went along the crest of the Bitterroots from Lolo Creek to Big Creek Lakes, which was kind of uh, a struggle. And that's where I first got the, the name Bushwhacking Bob, because <laughs> I often went off the major trails and went other places. Um, yeah, I, I don't, some of you may know Noelle Naden lives here in Missoula. She's a school psychologist. Uh, Bob Rivy worked for Forest Service, I believe, for a number of years. Um, Dave Johnson, somebody was talking, isn't that Dave Johnson? And I think that's Lee Barha, who, who ran the Pine Butte Reserve uh, Ranch for a number of years. And Patrick Lopez de Victoria, there and there. Mark Reagan lives in Helena. I see her once in a while. So I still remember a few of the names. And this was the faculty. Bud Moore had just retired from the Forest Service. He was in charge of fire for Region 1, had worked in DC for a number of years. Amazing guy. He grew up up Lolo Creek, finished eighth grade there, and started trapping on snowshoes over Lolo Pass before there was any road, and uh, kept his mother and uh, siblings uh, fed doing that. He started packing for the Forest Service, eventually became district ranger over on the Loxa, and just went on from there. One of the most well-read eighth grade graduates that I've ever met. Uh, amazing guy. Tom. 40 years ago and tonight, <laughs> Dexter Roberts uh, is still living here in Missoula. He's in, in an assisted care facility. And myself, how I looked 40 years ago. Uh, there, I hesitated to even put names up. There are so many faculty that have participated in the program over the years. But I sh did this to show really the interdisciplinary uh, nature still of of the program of all the different faculty that have participated and still are today. Um, for the first, what, 15 or 20 years of the Wilderness and Civilization Fall Treks, we were on the quarter system. And the quarter didn't start until late September. So we were usually out there during the first week of October and very often got clobbered. I shouldn't say very often, but a number of times got clobbered by snowstorms. And when we were, from then on, uh, those early couple years on, we uh, used the Rocky Mountain Front, both outside, uh, in fact, mainly outside the wilderness, actual designated wilderness. There's that band, well, now most of it is in wilderness as a result of the uh, Rocky Mountain Front Heritage Act last fall. Uh, but we did a lot of work, a lot of hikes. So I've covered most of the trails in the 20 years that I did the program, covered most of the trails from Highway 200 up to Highway 2. Uh, this particular year, we did get snowed in the Badger 2 Medicine area. We're crossing the river here and uh, sitting in the snow over there. Uh, you might recognize Caroline Bird there with her mouth open. <laughs> She's now, now head of the Greater Yellowstone Coalition. I told him after we got to across the river, the way you're going to warm your feet is to put your feet on each other's bellies. So that's, that's what <laughs> they're doing there. <laughs> and that's the gasp that Carolyn is letting out there <laughs> when somebody else's feet hit her belly. Uh, one of the first projects we got involved in, Senator Metcalf had requested that the forestry school do a study of the areas in the Senate Bill 393, which was called the Montana Wilderness Study Act. So uh, Dean Wambach and a group uh, studied the uh, timber resources in there, made some estimates of what the value of that resource was in each of those areas. But in the Wilderness Institute, we provided a lot of students to go out and look at the areas on the ground, examine the boundaries, uh, look at the wilderness characteristics, record any other information on resources in the area. And uh, 
this, uh, at that time, 1974, there was a lot of, uh, what should I say, anxiety, I guess, about the original roadless area review and evaluation. That's what rare is there. Uh, done by the forest service. A lot of people felt that they failed to recognize many of the roadless areas that were out there and uh, be they did it on district, ranger district boundaries. So if there was an adjacent district that uh, had part of a roadless area, they didn't really, often didn't recognize it as the same roadless area. So anyhow, that's partly why Senator Metcalf uh, was convinced to introduce this Wilderness Study Act uh, for nine of those areas. Uh, so, in fact, in 1974, we had a couple of teams out in Middle Fork of Judith and I think in the Taylor Hillgard area. And uh, 75, some more uh, students were out there. That bill did uh, pass eventually. These are the, the nine areas. Uh, one of them, the Taylor Hill Garden, became part of the Lee Metcalf Wilderness, and so that's no longer a wilderness study area. And the other one, the Elkhorns, in a separate piece of legislation, is a special management area, uh, no longer a wilderness study area. The other seven still are. Uh, there were challenges when some of those areas were uh, the Forest Service wanted to develop them. The MWA, Montana Wilderness Association, uh, filed a lawsuit, I think, in 96. And uh, it was upheld, I think, by the Ninth Circuit. Uh, so they are all seven of those still wilderness study areas. And they covered from east to west. Uh, the, one of the mountain ranges out in the prairies, the big snowies right near Lewistown, Montana, to the northwest, uh, very different habitats. Uh, I think th they intentionally picked a variety of uh, wilderness study areas around the state to cover different ecological situations and uh, topographic situations. The other uh, project early on was the um, Mission Mountain Tribal Wilderness, and that started out of a uh, wilderness and civilization class project in 1976. And Thurman Trosper, who I mentioned earlier, came down uh, from the Flathead where he lived up near Ronan, came down and met with the class several times. And they uh, then initiated uh, a study of the boundaries well, I might back up a little bit. Um, Bob Marshall in 1937, he, he, he lived here in uh, Missoula at that time, worked out of the federal building, and he was pretty uh, uh, free and easy with the pen, I guess. <laughs> he designated primitive areas all over the place, including uh, in the Mission Mountains, but he lapped over onto the tribal side of the Mission Mountains as well. Uh, call it a primitive area, but that was removed in 1959. And then, as I said, we uh, started work in 76, turned in a map and report to the tribe, and then the tribe turned around and asked the Wilderness Institute, and they gave us a little bit of support to develop a management, management plan. So in the summer of 77, we had a team, David Rockwell headed up the team, with uh, three or four other students, as I recall, and submitted a management plan the following December, I think, to the uh, Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribe. And in 79, the tribe did designate it as a tribal wilderness and uh, basically uh, left the boundaries pretty much intact, a couple minor changes, and then they hired subsequently a wilderness ranger for the area. This was the proposal that was turned in to the tribe. Oh, I have June 78 there. I guess I was wrong. Anyhow, it was a fairly substantial report, and they spent a lot of time documenting all the trails, uh, campsites, uh, the students that were out there that summer of 77. And because there was, there was no management like on Forest Service trails. There were just some of the trails were really obscure, very difficult to get up. 
um, but they do uh, manage now as a tribal wilderness, uh, the first one in the country, and I believe still the only tribal wilderness in the country. You do need, as a non-tribal member, you need a permit to go in there. Uh, that's Mission uh, Reservoir, Elizabeth Falls up above it there in that canyon, uh, and the beautiful Mission Valley looking out over the... In 1976, uh, uh, President Carter was elected in 76 till 80, and he really pushed, there had been a lot of work done to develop the Federal Land Policy Management Act, and he helped push to get that done in 1976. So that was the actual organic act for the BLM, the first time they were considered a land management agency, not just an agency set up to get rid of land, which they had been uh, up until that time. But they also were brought in under the Wilderness Act and had to initiate an inventory of their lands. And we had worked with them in fact, um, after Rare 2, urging BLM to use some of the same criteria that the Forest Service had done uh, with Rare 2, and they contracted the Wilderness Institute to uh, to go and inventory all of these roadless areas. Now, it was pretty. Uh, at the time, all they were working from is, is aerial photos and what they, knowledge they had of the area at the time. So the first job was to define a road. What is a road? And Robin worked on that project, uh, summer of 78, uh, where, you know, just two-wheel tracks through the, across the prairie. Is that a road or not? So all of these issues came up in the process of doing that. And this was the first one in the country, by the way, first. BLM inventory of roadless areas. Then they mapped the roadless areas and uh, described the wilderness characteristics. Um, so these, this is what they had to work with at the start. It's just a very rough map of these areas and that team did a great job out there uh, that summer. It resulted in a, a publication the following uh, fall. Uh, which is, it's about an inch thick. It's a pretty substantial uh, report on all the various roadless areas and ones that were recommended for wilderness study. And Ken was the lead author on that, along with the field team. We also did a project for the BLM on the Great Rift Primitive Area in Idaho. Andy Gibbs, who had worked on one of the S-393 areas earlier, became a graduate student and uh, did a management proposal and then the following year uh, an environmental analysis report for the BLM, again through the, the Wilderness Institute. <coughs> I threw in the Welcome Creek Wilderness, that was kind of an unusual situation. A, a, a Missoula teacher named Don Berg had an interest in the wilderness, in, in Welcome Creek and had done a study of the area. Uh, just on his own uh, during the summer as a high school teacher. And then one day I got a call from Bill Cunningham who was working at the Wilderness Society in D.C. at that time and he and the society were working on an Endangered American Wilderness Act where they took a number of areas around the country, put them into one omnibus bill uh, covering all those areas. And he uh, wanted to, he knew about Welcome Creek and he knew that I had been doing the elk study down there earlier. And uh, so he asked me to draw the boundaries of that area, which I did, and subsequently went in that way. Uh, one of the things they were doing is looking at areas that had been ignored or kind of gone over through the Rare 2 process. And uh, this uh, Welcome Creek was, was one of those. It also incru included there was, I think, eight or nine miles of road that was built into the area with hard money, um, that is, allocated, appropriated money for the Forest Service. But they couldn't sell any timber at the end of the road. That was out right on the ridge coming down from uh, on the Welcome Creek area. 
and that road was included within the wilderness, but that later put to bed. Uh, well, just over the years, we did a number of uh, conferences. The first was the Right to Remain Wild, a public choice, and Tim, that's your dad, Don Aldridge, speaking at the microphone there. Not a very good picture, but uh, Bud Moore sitting at the table beyond him. It was a great conference. Uh, we had the poet Gary Snyder came uh, and was uh, did a reading and was part of the uh, involvement. It was a three-day conference here on campus. And then um, we were the sponsor of the 1978 National Rare Two Conference. It was held right here on campus for the whole country. Uh, this was where it was first presented, laid out. And uh, uh, there were, I think, over a thousand people attended, as I recall, from all over, Forest Service people, uh, uh, wilderness uh, groups, all sorts of people attended that Rare Two Conference. and the, the uh, Rupert Cutler, uh, who pushed for the conference, came out as the keynote speaker or to open it up. There were subsequent Limits of Acceptable Change conference sponsored by the Institute, Wilderness Science Conference, uh, Busy Use Density, and so on. So uh, 2014 was the 40th. 50th anniversary, I got that wrong, didn't I? 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act. Uh, and we had a celebration here at, as well. Previous uh, directors included Alan McQuillan, uh, Wayne Fryman, both from the forestry school, Laurie Young, preceded Natalie. And Natalie has been on the job a little over a year. Uh, I did want to mention uh, the Arkwright uh, foundation. Uh, Stanley Arkwright was a geologist out of Billings and he just loved wilderness. He had a string of pack horses and he spent a lot of the summer going into wilderness areas. And he set up an endowment in the, to the forestry school in the 70s for wilderness education and research. So when we first started the Wilderness Institute, we found out about that endowment and it very specifically refers to wilderness education and research. And it was allocated to the institute at that time by, by Dean Wambach. Uh, we were only getting a couple thousand dollars out of that each year. Uh, Dale and I and some others went down and visited Marty Arkwright, a delightful lady in Billings. Uh, uh, she died, uh, I think, around 96, something like that. and. The, rest of the trust went into that endowment and now supports uh, quite a bit of the effort of the Wilderness Institute. So we need to recognize them. That, that really is the seed money or the, the, the yeast that keeps uh, the, the Institute growing and keeping these projects going out in the field, the field studies and so on. We also have three scholarships that have come in for uh, the Wilderness Institute. Matt Hansen was a, a wilderness and civilization student. He was a history major, but also he was uh, the son of Ripley Hugo. Ripley worked, when she first came to Missoula, worked at the forestry school as an editor. She married Dick Hugo, the parrot poet. And uh, so Matt was very uh, creative uh, in many ways. He worked for Smoke Elser as a packer one summer, and in the middle of that summer, discovered a major tumor. And by late that fall, he passed away. It just came like that. So I helped Ripley and her brother and several other people set up this endowment. And uh, are the applications past due now? It's still open. Still open, OK. They, they do make small grants for a variety of projects related to history, to wilderness, to uh, anything creative, really. Bill Wharf uh, set up a fellowship in honor of his two sons who separately died in accidents in 1996. And when his wife passed away in 2007, 
They called it the Wharf Family Memorial Fellowship for Student in the Wilderness and Civ program. And the last one here, I didn't realize was there, but Ben Cohen was a good friend of mine. I served with him in the legislature for several sessions. A wild guy, <laughs> neat guy, very outspoken. Uh, he liked to prod his uh, opponents on the other side of the aisle quite a bit. We called him Gentle Ben. But his wife, Connie, set up this uh, scholarship uh, in Ben's name. And if any of you have that scholarship, I would urge you to write a thank you letter to Connie uh, for setting that up. I'm sure we can find her address. <coughs> so moving into 2015, <laughs> 40 years later, basically the mission is the same. We can frame it in different words, different ways, but uh, I. I've spent two, almost two full days at the Wilderness Institute in the last couple of weeks digging through old files, and thank goodness they have a lot of the original files, and it was fascinating looking at them. I got carried away <laughs> going in different directions looking at them and looking at all the students that I had worked with in the past, and it was pretty neat doing that. And in the process, I also could see what a beehive of activity these two have going up there in the Wilderness Institute office. They're on the top floor of Main Hall. It's a, it's a ma major hike to get up there. <laughs> Four floors. So, <laughs> Nat <laughs> Natalie is the director and Rachel is the best supporting actress in this, pi in this picture anyhow. But I have one more picture of, Nat of uh, Rachel <laughs> and she's also a mom which is pretty neat. One of the biggest services you can do for mankind, right? Uh, so again, it's going strong. Uh, next fall will be the 40th year for wilderness and civilization. Uh, they're doing a lot of work, as you've heard, working with agencies and, and the public on studies of wilderness and wilderness study areas, outreach programs, uh, training. Again, this same model as 40 years ago. Some of you might recognize this picture. <laughs> a lot of the class of this year is, is here in the room, I think. Um, they trekked on the Rocky Mountain front last, last fall. We have quite a, a variety of faculty involved. Again, a pretty diverse interdisciplinary group, including art, English, uh, and those are the faculty for this year. Since 1975, we estimate that somewhere between 900 and 1,000 students have gone through the Wilderness and Civilization program, which is pretty amazing. Uh, I was involved the first half of that 40 years, I guess. I think I did 20 of the fall treks, covered, I think, around 1,500 miles total <laughs> over that time. But the thing I keep hearing over and over from people who've been through the program in the past is how it was really a life-changing experience for them. And, you know, I don't know all the reasons why. We can speculate, I guess, but part of it is the interdisciplinary approach because when you're in a particular major and you just stay with those folks, you're in a mindset that uh, goes with that group. And by spreading it out, to majors from all different disciplines, it's, it's pretty neat. I found as a faculty member that it was really delightful working with the group because they were so responsive <laughs> in the classroom. Uh, after having been out, and what I discovered is, you know, very often students are, are afraid to speak up in a classroom. And I always thought it was, well, they were afraid to talk because of the the professor up in the front of the room. But I've realized over the years that it's not the professor, it's their peers. You're afraid of speaking up because you look dumb to your peers if you say something. That disappeared in the wilderness civ program, right? You agree? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, that's my take on it. Uh, Th th there have been some outstanding uh, people that have gone on and won awards, Truman scholarships, uh, uh, Udall fellowships, uh, uh, a number of others, right? Uh, and they've gone on to 
many diverse occupations, uh, it's just, which is pretty neat also. In fact, the chief CEO of uh, Northwestern Energy went through the Wilderness Civilization program, Bob Rowe, met his wife, Melanie, in the program. And Bob is now the CEO at Northwestern Energy. Uh, Mike Manahan is a judge in Helena. His daughter, Mara, some of you know, uh, went through the program a couple years ago. Uh, kind of neat to see that. Looking back, uh, the citizen science program uh, is going strong, and they just found out the week before last that they got a grant from the National Forest Foundation to carry on the work uh, uh, assessing on the ground um, programs out in wilderness areas or wilderness study areas. Uh, they will have summer field studies going in the Absarca Beartooth, but more, more interesting to me was uh, BLM. <laughs> Again, contracting 40 years late, oh, well, whatever it is, 39 years later, to go back and look at some of the wilderness study areas in Montana, two in the Missoula District and five out in the upper Missouri River breaks. Um, so that'll be interesting to see, um, to kind of go back and look at those areas again. Maybe you'll have to join them again, Robin. <laughs> There's a distance education program also. Uh, we can take classes online. Uh, and then the Wilders Information Network in cooperation with the Carhartt Center and the Leopold uh, Wilderness Research Institute, uh, and Lisa Ronald, is that right? Yeah, works uh, through both, as I understand it, a split appointment with Wilderness Institute and, and the Forest Service. <coughs> For the first time uh, last year, uh, Natalie and Rachel put together a freshman experience, which involved uh, advertising to incoming freshmen a four-day backpack trip in wilderness areas around uh, Montana uh, before they start their first classes. And 62 people went through that freshman experience program and 14 uh, undergrads who had been through wilderness and civilization were their guides. So it's kind of neat that they were able to interact with people who were a little farther along. But it, for those who took it, it was a great experience. I think it's a great program, a great tool for the University of Montana to attract students and to retain students because they get tied into the program and into the state and the university. I keep hitting the wrong button here. Future. There are still wilderness study areas that need to be studied to determine whether or not they're wilderness. We were, the, I think, the only state that did not have a statewide wilderness bill. Idaho, Idaho also? Yeah. Okay. But they did act on a number of wilderness areas in Idaho. <coughs> Anyhow, we did not, a lot of states after Rare 2 had a, a state wilderness bill where they took all of the Rare 2 recommended wilderness areas and passed them in one bill. We did not have that. And so we went through a long period without getting any new uh, designations in Montana. I think the human values of wilderness are only going to increase with time, and we need wilderness areas as a barometer to civilization now. Climate change. I have to talk about climate change. I can't help it. <laughs> I've been giving talks on climate change and wildlife, and... Uh, it's, this is really serious. And uh, the picture on the left there shows Grinnell Glacier taken in July, middle of July, 1936. You can see it was an active moving glacier with crevasses. And on the right is uh, what it looked like in 2014. And there's a tarn, a tarn lake. My daughter's named Tarn. Uh, the interesting thing, dramatic thing to me about this, this picture on the left was taken 17 days before I was born. So this is what's happened in my lifetime. And most of it probably in the last 20 or 30 years. So we have 25 out of 150 glaciers remaining in Glacier National Park. You've all heard about that. There's been a lot 
out lately. The National Climate Assessment came out last May. The IPCC report in September came out and there was a lot of media attention to this nationwide because the scientists around the world have expressed very grave concern about what's going on. This shows just uh, temperature changes that have happened since uh, 1900. And I put this in to show it's the geographic variability. It's not uniform throughout the world. Uh, more prominent at higher latitudes. You've all probably seen the relationship between temperature and carbon dioxide concentrations. I put this in to show the curve is that tail end out there it's from 1958 on measure, actual measured CO2 in the atmosphere at Mauna Loa Observatory. Going back from there they've taken ice core samples from Antarctica, Greenland uh, and finding the bubbles in there they could assess the CO2 concentrations going way way back. They also because of different isotopes of carbon, they know what carbon is due to uh, human-caused fossil fuel emissions. But isn't so the climate deniers, well, here again, <laughs> this is when I was born. That's how much change there has been in my lifetime. And I hope to be around a while longer. <laughs> Uh, this is a 33% increase just in those years, which is pretty dramatic. Well, the climate deniers say, well, this is just part of a natural cycle, that we've always had natural cycles, and sure enough, they're right. About every 100,000 years, you have a rise in CO2 level, but in 800,000 years, it never got above 300 parts per million, and the day before yesterday, it was 403 parts per million of CO2. That huge spike that you see way over on the right is kind of because it's jammed down into this 800,000 year uh, graph. It's just a straight line going up. This is if you don't remember anything else from this lecture, remember this slide. 800,000 years, never went above 300 parts per million. Now we're at 403. And again, I told you they could separate out man caused uh, from natural background factors. A lot of modeling has been done from the IPCC report. This latest model shows that if we rapidly reduce emissions starting now, we could keep the uh, temperature increase, hold it at about 2.6 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. If we continue at the present rate, we're going to be up at 8.5, and pl places like Montana, it'll be even more than that. This is the same thing shown on maps. Uh, if we rapidly reduce emissions, the map on the left shows you what changes will occur uh, by 2100 and on the right if we continue at the same rate of emissions. For Montana, we've increased since 1895 2.6 Fahrenheit and again there are geographic differences within Montana but the surprising thing to me and the climate office here on campus ran off data for me by month for Montana dramatic increase in January and March, 9.1 degrees in January, 8.4 degrees in March uh, since from 1948 up to 2012. This is going to have major ecological significance uh, it, and it certainly does for wildlife in particular when you get winter melts. Uh, with a snowpack, a good snowpack in December, it makes it very difficult for animals to get around. We're going to see increases in fire. Uh, Steve Running put out this publication in Science showing the increases in fire over time. So we are going to see changes in, in our wilderness areas, whether we like it or not. 
I sound pretty pessimistic, <laughs> but there are some good signs around the world. I think the China agreement last fall was very significant, even though many would argue it didn't go far enough. Uh, the, there are more and more people installing solar cells now on their houses ar in, around Montana. I see them in Helena. I see them in Missoula. Uh, in developing countries, it's really the way to go. You can't build fossil fuel uh, transmission and lines and generating plants. In fact, when I was in the Philippines, there's 7,000 islands in the Philippines with people living on most of them, and you just can't distribute electricity. But the good thing was I saw a number of uh, wind turbines there and a number of places, resorts, and, and houses with uh, solar installation, which great place for it. <laughs> plenty of sunshine there and uh, prevailing winds. Last year, there were 162 countries had events uh, related to climate change. Lima, Peru, uh, Philippines, Cebu City, uh, and New Delhi, and 400,000 people turned out in New York City. So what that means, hopefully, is this. <laughs> If the people lead, eventually the leaders will follow. Unfortunately, we have too many politicians who don't believe that it's either not happening or they don't believe that um, human burning of fossil fuels has anything to do with it. The picture on the left shows flooding on the Thames River just outside of London last year, almost exactly a year ago. Uh, two of our members of Congress fit in that category of non-believers. Future of the Wilderness Institute, again, I think the value of wilderness areas is going to increase. I think it's important to keep the institute going. We have an increasingly complex world, and our interdisciplinary approach is valuable. Uh, citizen science is increasingly important. The National Audubon Society put out their report on climate change, which is a massive effort, a really well done piece of work. Uh, I think it came out in May this past year. No, it was October this past year, just last fall. Uh, if any of you are interested in birds, you should take a look at that. They recognize 315 species of birds in the U.S. that are in danger with clim climate change. With financial cutbacks, as Dave can tell you, I think it's important that we continue the coordination that's, that is going on. Finally, uh, I think we also have to keep pressure on the UM administration to recognize that this is a good thing and a good thing to keep it going. Uh, we need to continue the administration supporting it through the Arkwright Foundation because it does generate a lot of other outside funding. We need to keep wilderness and civilization program going. Uh, and then we also, and this has been a problem from day one, as Tom can tell you, uh, there is a problem with the administration recognizing that the faculty that teach in the program or participate in Wilderness Institute activities convincing them that it's not just a drain on their department. Uh, I know Tom had difficulty and Dexter Roberts had difficulty. Their departments said, well, you, you got to be teaching freshman philosophy or freshman English classes, not wasting your time at the Wilderness Institute. This is pretty narrow-minded. I mean, I can understand in a way that they have tough time allocating resources within their department and they need to keep it going but you know you also we are a university we're a, a place to expand learning for students and we have to get past that and I understand it's it still is a problem with some departments and and getting the kind of support for the faculty that you need in order to keep them uh, going I think with that, uh, I'm done. <laughs> so, thank you, and uh, <laughs> I raced through that kind of quickly. <laughs> I didn't know how many slides I had. Uh, any questions? Anybody 
Have any questions, historical or otherwise? Yes. Looking back on your career and how much you've accomplished, um, what advice would you give to yourself when you were just starting out on your career? Or <laughs> wow, it's a, it's a that's an interesting question for me because as you probably saw, I just took different twists and turns along the way. Um, I got involved in politics and served in the legislature for eight sessions in the Montana legislature. And I'm, you know, I'm, in some ways, I'm really proud of the service I did there, and I got a lot done. Um, so I, I kind of, in my own mind, draw this equivalency between any bill that I sponsored and a publication in the scientific arena <laughs> as one and the same. <laughs> I've sponsored the Montana Stream Access Law, which is now, and it's the, this is the 30th year since passage of the Montana Stream Access Law, Montana Superfund Law, just lots of other things I was pretty involved in in the legislature. But your question is, what advice do I have for somebody starting out? Um, <coughs> You have to pursue your dream, I guess. What, and your dream doesn't always maybe match the job market, but uh, there w I've seen a lot of dedicated people who uh, have stuck with it and stuck with it and finally ended up working uh, in the field they want to. Uh, I know, you know, a lot. Park service was very difficult to get jobs for many, many years, and I know people that worked for years and years as temporaries with the Park Service and finally uh, got on later on. Uh, it's tough. Uh, I, I think no matter what you do, I think it's important to be involved in, as a citizen. A citizen is your f first responsibility. Uh, vote. <laughs> uh, get involved locally with groups that are pursuing the interests you have. I don't know, did I get anywhere near your question? <laughs> Any other questions? Maybe David, you can offer them all jobs, right? Yeah, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> Any others? If not, thank you.